Um, let me try and answer some of these questions. I mean, the first the first question that was specifically to me from the gentleman from the Fire and Appeals Board. That's a question that can keep us busy for all day, many, many days about culture. Um, I think uh, kind of a short answer to your questions, within South Africa we see probably culture is a loaded term, but maybe kind of micro-cultures in relation to firearms because we have sports shooters communities, we have hunters communities, we have collectors, we have enthusiasts. Certainly we've seen probably changes in behavior in terms of people carry weapons, where they carry weapons, I think the law has, has restricted that kind of type of behavior, that type of how weapons are used and carried, I certainly that's, that's what it's promoted. Um, I think this issue around within South Africa we have a, a culture of violence problem that cuts across races and cuts across uh, age groups as well and the manner in which as South Africans, and this is speaking in very arrogant terms, resolve conflict and the use of violence in that particular conflict I think is quite important um, and we need to look for techniques to do that and when one has a gun in the equation it just increases the, the risk of lethality quite significantly but there's, it, it, it's complex and we need to try and understand it more effectively just to give you an, an anecdotal reference here we just did a study last year and it was an ethnographic study on the youth gang phenomenon in Kailicha which is very different to the gangs of Man Manenberg and Hanover Park the traditional kind of colored kept colored gangs this is of young boys essentially who are engaging in armed conflict with one another in a battle type of sense where they go at each other with pangas and golf clubs and knives and axes um, and it's two types of gangs, the Buras and the Vatos, and the research, the ethnographic research that was done and asked gangsters, why no firearms? The first question was, well, we actually like to get close. Firearms create distance, we want to get close, and this is part of, you know, the, the nature of this particular violence. So, I mean, it's very isolated, but I think we don't really have a particularly good understanding of the nature of the culture of violence on these particular aspects. I think Rotella Capano, Capano Rotella from the Medical Research Council has done some really good work on masculinity within South Africa, and it's the understanding of, of masculinity, I think, where this comes from. Um, particularly also studies on violence against women and children has sort of come up with some fairly good analysis of, you know, why it is that men perpetrate violence against women and children. Um, then it's the question of data and access to data. And I know it's, it's quite refreshing to hear that things have changed and they have been changing recently. But previously, some years ago, the previous management of the Central Firearm Registry was not willing to part with any data. And I think it was sort of concerns around security, concerns around maybe the accuracy, concerns that they'd be criticized. There were court cases happening right up at the constitutional court levels. So I'm just speculating, but certainly they were not parting with the data under any circumstances. Um, and I think we're probably at a much weaker point now because that data wasn't released. So we are much, we don't understand as we should understand. So I think it's certainly a welcome trend that um, the secretariat and the police are being much more open in terms of sharing of that information. Um, then it was this, then Paul, your, your question about the data and the trends. And the murder rate, certainly if we look at the murder rate, that did come down. Um, the problem is we don't really have particularly reliable data from 94, but it was the firearm homicides that come that peak in 98 and then start a decline there, then slow down. I don't think we understand enough of that decline, but what we do know of a lot that was done and sort of current research that I'm doing is I think some of the answer lies within the policing thereof in terms of that dramatic decline, in terms of soaking up of firearms in specific areas where there were high levels of violence. So I think that the thing here is we want to understand what effects policing, the law, self-defense is hard. We've got to look at areas where the highest levels of violence is happening. Um, so we just don't know enough about that. In places like in Yanga, for example, we don't. We, we're useful to ask a question in Yanga. To what extent has the use of a firearm prevented yourself from getting injured? Because there are, you know, more than 300 homicides a year in a place like in Yanga, compared to someone like Claremont, which is only a few. So I think it's really about the kind of the micro studies and the context. The same applies to the study that Rachel Jukes, Nima Abrams, and Shanaz Matthews have done on, on femicides and firearms. I think when we look at things in an aggregate way, sometimes we lose the detail, and it's about I think, trying to understand the context in which this violence is happening. So it was 
suggestions and comments made about you know, domestic violence registers and police not taking action. I think it's very much, and it varies from context to context, and some police stations are better than others. And we know that from the Commission of Inquiry into Kailicha that there were some serious problems in Kailicha about general police response to crime versus somewhere like Claremont, for example, or Mowbray, where you've got you know far more kind of responsive police. So I think it's about needing to drill down the sort of point of view to get a much better understanding. And I think that's what I would like to encourage. Thank you.